Hello and welcome to the Life Illuminated Podcast. I'm Maggie Kelly, your host. Today I'm actually going to share with you a, an interview that I did with a magnificent guy named Lance Essios. And he has his own podcast called The University of Adversity. And this was Lance interviewing me. So I'm just shaking it up a little bit. I hope you enjoy. Settle in. Welcome back, everybody. Super grateful to have you guys here. Today's episode is amazing. It's a little bit longer than normal, but I really encourage you to listen to this right till the end. If you want to know about mindfulness, meditation, and all of that, and how this can completely change your life, look no further because this episode will do it for you. I promise you that. My next guest has worked with some of the biggest people in this space and i'm telling you this episode will change your life if you allow it if you listen and you listen till the end so my next guest spent several years of her 20s and her 30s in middle management in corporate america for one of the largest media companies in the world she was definitely one on the treadmill many of us believe in the road we're supposed to be on to be successful in her mid 30s she traded her briefcase for a stroller and happily left it all behind to become a full-time mom. She hit a wall about 11 years ago when she found herself completely and totally overwhelmed with the stress of raising kids underneath it all that there simply had to be more to life. Today, my guest, Maggie Kelly, is a meditation and spiritual teacher, spiritual life coach, podcaster, author and founder of Satsang House, she received her meditation instructor certification from the, jo the Chopra Center and opening at Satsang House in 2016 after having spent over 12 years studying under Deepak Chopra. Being in the now is so important and being present and that, that man really helped me realize that. I read the book, The Power of Now, three times, I believe. All right, sit back, relax. Maggie Kelly coming right up. Maggie, how are you? So great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Lance. I'm excited to be here too. <laughs> me too. Me too. I um, obviously anyone that hears my show, I talk a lot about meditation and spirituality and how it's affected my life in such a short period of time. And I, I just, I feel it's a tool for everybody, but it's it's hard to really, um, I guess it's it's hard to get everybody to understand that unless they figure it out for themselves because it's just such a journey. You know, and I, um, I'm just so excited to talk about this because whenever I get in, I, it's been a while since I had a really good conversation about this topic. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Maybe just for the listeners, other than the intro into your story, I always like to kind of get it through your own words, a little bit of describing a bit about your background because you've worked with some amazing people who are going to get into and I'm just curious, how did you start this whole journey? What did you do before? And how did this evolve? Well, that's kind of, a, it's interesting, a, a circuitous route. You know, I um, was in sales and marketing for HBO for a number of years. Ended wow. up getting married and having a couple kids. And my youngest um, is chronically ill. He has cystic fibrosis, which is a mm -hmm. lung disease. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of sent me over the edge, just sort of this place of I'm supposed to fix it. I'm supposed to make it better. I'm supposed to know the answers. Um, and if I don't, I'm supposed to find the best of the best to do. And I'm his mom. I'm supposed to know how to fix this. Mm. And um, somewhere in there in all of the, I, I actually call it living grief because that's, kind of what it is because cystic fibrosis is incurable it's progressive it's life shortening mm -hmm. um, and it's chronic um, there's lots and lots of hope today but but he's 18 now and so when he was born it was a little more grim mm -hmm. and the idea that this little baby when I was holding him in my arms was going to have this life of chronic hospitalizations and chronic lung conditions um, really hit hard as his mom. So 
I think I just, you know, I got to a place where I was so stressed out and so um, desperate and really just living my life by the seat of my pants, waiting every day for the next shoe to drop, um, chronically listening for, you know, what does that cough sound like? What is, uh, is it going to be okay today? Should I call the doctor? When should I call the doctor? And I found myself just spinning, just absolutely spinning. I, I tell people that I was hyperventilating through my life because I was just going from one thing to another to another and trying not to fall apart. Um, and something, something said, you know, something's got to give. You can't keep living like this. I didn't like who I was. I didn't want to continue being that kind of mom that was completely stressed out. And um, truly not present, just just surviving, completely in survival mode. And I remembered that I had read um, some books in college written by Deepak Chopra. Mm -hmm. And I still had one on the shelf in the living room that I hadn't picked up in I don't even know how many years. And I, I saw in the back flap that he had a center for well-being right in my own neighborhood, about 20 minutes from my house. Oh, wow. And so I decided, okay, I'm just, I'm going to give it a whirl, whatever. I'm just going to try this program. And every single one of Deepak's programs begin with the practice of teaching you meditation. Mm. And I had never meditated, not a single moment in my life. And um, I started meditating then during that program. And then I continued my practice. And one week turned into a month, another month, another month. And um, that's kind of how I got started because I started to really understand that subtle but very profound shift that started to happen to me in meditation. I started to um, become more present, certainly, and a lot calmer. Um, and just... It just changed my whole life, not, not quickly, not overnight. Meditation, as you well know, is a practice. It's, um, you know, yeah. It takes dedication on mm. our part, right? So that's kind of how I got started. What did, you, what did you like about Deepak, though, specifically? Because there's a lot of mm -hmm. programs out there, right? There's a lot of people that are kind of teaching the same sort of thing, but sometimes you can hear that same message a few times and then that one person can really get through to you. What was it about him that was different? Or is that the only one that you really explored? No, I've explored quite a few since, but I, you know, I spent about 10 years with Deepak in a bunch of different ones of his mm. um, programs because there's something about, number one, there's something about his voice that for yeah. me is extremely soothing. I love the guy. Like, yeah. I really do. I've never met him, but I love him. I love listening to him. Yeah. He's amazing. He is. And he's absolutely stunningly brilliant mm. and extremely prolific writer and um, very, very humble and just a beautiful, beautiful persona. Mm -hmm. And what I love about Deepak is he was a medical doctor first. And so mm -hmm. he's a scientist. He comes at it in spirituality from a science background, yeah. which when he starts getting into deep conversations with scientists, it certain, certainly proves to be a good thing that he has some background to be able to spar with them. Yeah. And what I like about Deepak is that he always invites somebody to come to the stage to speak with him. And so it's not just him sitting on the stage talking. It's him actually having enriching and enlightening conversations with other people within the spiritual community who, you know, he can spar with and push, his but push buttons with and all of that. So the learning takes place in the listening of the conversation, really. Yeah. He, yeah, there's something special about him. And I like that idea too, when there's, there's that science background behind it, because then, because it gets so, so many people get tied up with the woo woo aspect of it. And it's, it's kind of like even Dr. Joe Dispenza, you know, when it comes to 
talking about meditation. He was the first person that allowed me to really believe in it because it actually shows what happens to your brain. It actually shows you your state changes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a lot of people need in our society is to be able to see that. Well, as human beings, we want certainty in all yeah. aspects aspects of our lives yeah. we always want to know the answer how it's going to turn out i sure am not going to commit unless i know for sure it's going to work out and that's what trips us up and i think that's what was tripping me up with my son is that i mm -hmm. thought you know i was supposed to have the answer i was supposed to know how it would look and turn out and i was supposed to fix it because i'm his mom right and a few years into meditation is when i it really hit me it hit me so hard that I actually laughed out loud to realize that I'm not in charge and that I never, never was. Uh. And what a, what a silly and arrogant way to be to think that I was, that I was somehow going to manage this whole situation and make it all better or that I was somehow supposed to. And I just, I laughed out loud because it was, it was like, oh my God, you dummy. You're not in charge. You never were. This mm -hmm. kid's on loan to you and you're just here to do the best thing you can for him as long as you have him and the rest isn't up to you. Huh. So that was, you know, I always say my son is my greatest, one of my greatest teachers because of that. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And it's, that's so difficult for so many people to be able to comprehend and to understand is that we, we want to control everything. We want to be able to, we feel that because I don't have kids, but I know how my parents were. It's, you have this kid and you feel that you need to be the one that's doing all the stuff for them and you're going to be the answer. And that's just so interesting to hear because so many people are going to go through that whole thing, their whole life suffering, thinking that it's their fault that this is happening or whatever it may be. Well, there is a lot of solace. There's a lot of peace in letting go yeah. and surrendering. You know, it was almost like the whole weight of it came off. Mm. Not that I'm not responsible to this day for him. Of course. But that I don't have to worry every minute of every day about how it's going to turn out because that part's not my problem. Right. <laughs> I'm going to do the best that I can every single day. And that's all I can do. That's all any of us can do. Yeah. So, okay, let's just unpack this a little bit because this is really interesting to me. So you're doing these meditations and what are some of the changes though in your behaviors on a daily basis? towards this towards yourself that you were that you started to notice that because meditation is a funny thing you there, you, you want to quantify it you want to have this physical thing like yes it's working but it's not it's it doesn't just drop something in front of you like that you know and what i'm curious about is what are some of the things that you started to notice that really was like whoa okay Oh, I, I love this question because I have students, I have a meditation and spiritual center here in San Diego, and I teach meditation pretty much daily. Um, and some of the students that come to me, they're absolutely sure that if I teach them how to meditate and they walk out the door, they're going to have some epiphany. And what we don't understand, I think, when we start to meditate is that it doesn't work like that. That for some, certainly for some, like an Eckhart Tolle or somebody like that, the enlightenment can truly strike out of nowhere and hit profoundly. But that's rare. More than likely, it is a gradual process. And it's ne a never-ending process. You're not awakened ED. We're chronically and constantly awakening. Yeah. And the most important part is to be present for that. And so what I noticed in meditation, a couple of things. One of the other things my students always come and say, they're sure that they can't meditate because they can't stop thinking. Yeah. And the first thing I say is, that isn't what you're supposed to do. I don't want you to stop thinking. Because if you stop thinking, you're not going to be able to find your way back home from here. Right? 
<laughs> so meditation isn't about not thinking. It's about slowing down the thinking, slowing down the thoughts long enough to reconnect with that space in between the thoughts. Mm. That silent space in between the thoughts in Sanskrit is called Atman Darshan, which is so beautifully translated as glimpsing the soul. Mm. So that place in between all of that crazy chatter is that Atman Darshan, or we call it the gap. That space in between one thought and another thought. And that's the place where Deepak would say to you that we are learning how to remember. We're remembering ourselves. We're bringing ourselves back to a state of wholeness. That we're actually, it's, it's almost as if we have a kind of spiritual Alzheimer's. Because it's not like we're going out there looking for our spiritual selves. Our spiritual selves are always there. Mm. We're the ones who leave. It's like mm. the silence, right? The silence is always there. You don't yeah. have to go on vacation to find it. <laughs> you can sit down on a cushion or a chair or your bed for 20 minutes every single day, and you can return to that silence at any time, in any moment, anywhere. Mm. But we think, I think part of this goes back to our conversation earlier about certainty. We think that it's somehow a place to get to. And if I strive and I grasp and I cling and I work really, really hard, I'll get there. Yeah. There's no end game here. There's no end game. So some of the things that I noticed in answer finally to your question is I noticed that my internal dialogue started to slow down and that when I caught myself in deep, you know, crazy bill thought bill that I was better able to bring myself back to present moment. And that's exactly what meditation is all about. I teach mantra meditation and mantra literally means a vehicle for the mind. And the reason I love mantra meditation, and Deepak taught me mantra, and Deepak learned under Maharishi, um, mantra meditation for me is really helpful because I got this crazy mind that just wants to talk to me all day me long. Me too. I think we all do, right? Yeah. Just this like never-ending internal dialogue. Sometimes we even have both sides of the conversation. Yeah. in our own heads, right? Mm. So it's not like we're going to stop this, but I tell my students, this is a dangerous neighborhood to be in alone, in your head. Very mm. dangerous neighborhood, because the problem is, is we believe that internal dialogue. We think that our thoughts are who we are. Our thoughts are not who we are. We're just the person thinking the thoughts. The thoughts are not necessarily true. But we tend to think that we are whatever we're thinking up here. We think our judgments are the truth. We, we think our personal views of ourselves are the truth. When you sit to meditate and close your eyes and I give you the mantra, mm -hmm. the, the training is that when you are repeating the mantra and you notice that your mind gets dragged away into thoughtville, and all that chatter starts coming up, then you bring yourself back to repeating the mantra. What's the mantra though? What do you say? Well, I, I offer a class where I can calculate um, the mantra, your own personal mantra oh. based on the date, time, and location of your birth. Really? The, the, oh, wow, the, is that the, ever cool? The sound vibration that was happening at the moment oh. you came into the manifest. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I've and never that's, heard that. that's Joytish astrology. Wow. And that's how I learned. And so I have my own personal mantra based on my birth date, time, and location. And I also offer that to my students. But if I'm doing an introduction course, I typically use the mantra so hum. So hum. So hum. You just mm -hmm. say that so hum. So hum literally means so in Sanskrit, hum. I am. Mm. So 
it really it doesn't mean much. You can't assess a, a, a assign a meaning to it mm. because that's all it is. I am. I just am. I'm not even Lance. I'm not yeah. even Maggie. I just am. So the minute you're going into meditation, you continually repeat so hum, so hum. So hum, and, I'm going to write this down, so hum. And then your mind invariably will get hijacked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and off you go into crazyville, thoughtville, yeah. right? And then you can remind yourself once you notice that, you can remind yourself to return to the mantra which helps you return to the present moment. And that's the name of the game, right? So you do that over and over and over and over and over again. And that's the training. Mm. So you're building a muscle around returning to that gap, to returning to that quiet space between all that chatter. You're building a muscle that says to your brain, no, 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 I'm not going to, go for the chatter. You're not going to hijack me chatter. Mm. I am going to get, I'm going to get you back under control here for a moment and we're going to just settle down. It's a nice place to be when you get there. It's a beautiful place to be. Most people don't realize that meditation is part of the practice of yoga. It's yeah. one of the eight limbs of yoga. And yoga literally means union or yeah. yoke, like the yoke between one ox and another ox as they're be plowing a field. Huh. It means the mm. yoke or the union. And that union is the union between body, mind, and spirit. And so part of the meditation, especially for us who are so, so busy and overworked and stressed beyond, is to first settle the physiology. So if we can settle our physiology, our mind and our thoughts will settle as well. Hmm. And you have a much better chance of returning to the present moment if you're not twitching and running around and where's my to-do list and boy, I got to get to that meeting and you know, I forgot to get the milk at the store or whatever it is. So we start by settling your physiology. And so the, the eight limbs of yoga, the first is who are you in a social, as a social being? Do you, um, do you care that there's plastic in the ocean? Do you care that there are girls being sex trafficked on the border of California? Do you care about homeless children on the streets. Who are you in a social, mm. global sense? The second one is who you are on a personal sense. Are you trustworthy? Are you honest? Do you have integrity? Are you kind? The third limb of yoga is your pranayamas or your life force breaths. Because if you take a breath, you cannot be separated from your environment. And if you can key into the fact that you are part of the environment, you're much bigger than this body here. Mm. That's the third limb. The fourth limb is the actual physical practices, the asanas, the postures that we're used to. When, when traditional Western people think of yoga, they think only of the postures. But that's just the fourth limb of yoga. Mm. The fifth, sixth, and seventh, and eighth limb of yoga have everything to do with what comes out of your yoga practice, what comes out of your meditation practice, what comes out of all of that. Mostly your presence of mind and who you become as you meditate. Hmm. So that's part of it too. So it's a, it's a holistic approach. It's not we're just going to meditate and hope for the best. It's yeah. the whole thing. It's who are you in the world? So amazing that there's just so much there. Why do you think that, you know, the chatter that we have in our head, why, why is negative thoughts the thing that, that ends up being the thing, the self-doubt, the lack of belief? Is it because most people around us are thinking that? I've always, I've, I've, I've sat back and wondered, like, why is that the, why do we have to program ourselves to be positive so much? Why is negative always the, the thing that most are? And why are those the thoughts that come in? 
Well, we've trained ourselves. We've given ourselves mantras just like that yeah. in our own heads. You know, I'm a dummy. I shouldn't have said that. Why didn't I do that? Or I was late. Darn it, I'm late again. All of that stuff is a way to bring yourself down and keep you, keep you paralyzed, keep you small. Keep Where you did that come from? Like, why, does that, why is that the thing? that The lack of presence to your thinking, believing your thoughts. Thinking that your thoughts are who you are. We can create whatever mantra we want. You could, you could sit down and create a mantra, I'm awesome. Or you could create a mantra that says, I'm a dummy. It's sort of like that. Like We are creating our own internal dialogue all the time. And we're full of judgment and evaluation and criticism. And Mostly, I think it comes from a space of believing that happiness somehow is going to come from out here. That if I just grasp or cling or work mm -hmm. hard enough, I'll be happy. Yeah. If I, if I do this, I'll have a better job. If I drive that car, I'll be happy. If I get my hair cut in this way, I'll, I'll feel better. If I'm married to that person, I'm going to be, I have made it. If I have a three car garage, I got it. Yeah. But that's where we've gotten hooked. That's where yeah. we've gotten suffering. That's exactly it. Because we believe that when we get all those variables in line, we're, we're going to be happy. And the problem is, is as soon as we get all that, we're not any happier than we were when we started. Yeah. Because happiness doesn't come from out there. No. There's nothing out there that you need to have or be that or get or strive towards that's going to make you happier nothing returning to your innermost self is where you're going to find the happiness because true state of presence and true happiness is always and already existing so we're not going to meditate in order to get happy or calm down we're going to meditate to return ourselves to the happiness that's already and always existing, inherent in all of us. Mm. So this is where Deepak says you're remembering yourself, mm. so returning to that state of wholeness that already exists. You're not trying to find it. Yeah, I've, I've talked about this a lot too. And it's not the externals that are going to bring us the things that we think they are because those things, once you get those things or the job title, there's always going to be a level up. There's always going to be something else. And I've talked to people that played pro sports, people who made it. And when they get there, they say the best part was the come up. It's like, and, and it's funny because even in my own life, I've seen it as well. It's, it's you, we, we have it and we have it already inside of us. And I've, I've experienced that too. When I go off the path of making sure that I, I um, fill my cup by the meditations and really practicing gratitude and that kind of stuff to start my day, I really feel myself just not, I feel myself suffering more. Like that's the thing. I want the thing or the this or the that. But when I make sure to do the things that I know are going to allow me to calm that chatter, it's just a smoother day. Things just seem to work out better. Well, one of the things we all have to be mindful is, of is that we live in the Western society, which if you yeah. turn on the TV, it tells you that that's yeah. how you think. Mm. You should think that if you buy X, Y, and Z or you eat at this place, you're going to be a better for it. Mm. And so we first need to make sure we're paying attention to what we are consuming. And I don't mean eating. Mm. I mean Practicing mindful consumption includes what am I taking in from outside? Am I taking in toxic people? Am I eating the wrong foods? Am I watching gratuitous violence or sex for no apparent reason just to pass the time? Am I somebody who drinks too much or ha does some kind of drugs or gambles or watches porn? How am I filling up that silent moment to mm -hmm. avoid my own reality because yeah. that's the key if you can catch yourself in the moment of not being very mindfully 
consuming. Yeah. You have a fighting chance of making a different choice. But if you're not present and you're just reaching for whatever that is that fills that silence or that void or that loneliness or whatever it is you're looking for, if you're just going to fill it up without any kind of consciousness around it whatsoever, then you are going to feel that way. You are going to feel the way you just described. Yeah. You're going to never feel like there's enough. Yeah. It's never going to be, you're never going to be content. You're never going to find a state of joy. So I always recommend that, you know, mindful consumption yeah. is one of the first soul work exercises I give my students is start paying attention to what you're consuming. And does that mean that you should take CNN off of your phone as an app? Yes. Yes, that's what that means for sure. It does yeah. because we are addicted yeah. to anything that can help take us out of our own suffering, our own unhappiness. Mm -hmm. So I say let's flip that around and let's go inward and actually look at your suffering. Look mm -hmm. at what is causing despair, what is causing you unhappiness. Yeah. And once you confront that, then you have that's where the gold is that's where the gold is but most of us love to run from anything painful yeah we, oh, don't, gosh. we don't even realize that we're running either no i don't want to deal with it i uh, you deal with it i'll deal with it another time oh no i'm not going to call him i don't want to have that conversation whatever that is right we don't want to be straight mm. with each other we don't want to say what's there to say whether it's mm you know, good or bad or ugly or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, that's the basis of all of our relationship is communication. And if we're going to run and hide from our own feelings and our own selves, then we're going to be in trouble down the road here. I mean, you can see it, right? You can yeah. see it globally and you can certainly see it in our country that we're on opposite sides of the fence all the time. Nobody can listen to each other anyone who might have a different opinion mm. yeah that's a problem right it's a lack would of power that, would you say though that things are people are waking up a little bit more like let's say from when you started this journey have you seen like a massive because deepak 10 20 years ago wasn't as popular as he is now Right. No, Deepak was, the first class I took <laughs> was with Deepak in a room with 20 people. But now he's massive. And he taught it. He taught it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And now it's hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds. And would I say that people are starting to wake up? Some. Some, yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's hard for me to tell you because I have, I'm, this is my life. Right. I yeah. teach meditation. My whole reason for Amazing. being is to create world peace one person at a time through oh, meditation. Yeah. And what I do is attract people who want that. Right. So it's hard for me to say in a generalization for sure. if, if we're all starting to wake up. But I think we have to. We really have to. Yeah. We really um, do. You know, the first book that really got, which really, okay, I was, this was probably in two, I was living in Australia and I was reading a lot of biographies and things that were making me feel bad, you know, like reading about, you know, I was, I was working in bars, but doing, living a toxic lifestyle. And I was reading these like Rolling Stone biographies and like these, like really ones that made me feel not so nice but I read them for the entertainment. But then I started, I got this pull to read something that has some value to it. And I read the book that I was, I was drawn to was The Power of Now. Mm. That was the one book that the first thing that just, I don't know what it did, but something, something sparked something in there. And I read it over, I think I read it three times because I didn't understand it that much the first time. And then I started to get it. But then I started to understand what now meant. He kept saying now, not, not the past, not the word now. And I'm like, what do you mean? Finally, I got it. I got yeah. it. And that book, even though after that, you know, I still had, you know, but a journey of itself before I kind of woke up a bit. 
that book was amazing. And that's why I find it fascinating because you've worked with Eckhart Tolle. Is it Tolle or Tolle? It's Tolle. Tolle. He is amazing. Oh. He's so amazing. And he spoke on the stage as well with Ram Dass. And he, mm. like, this is, this is just like, to see that when I was reading all your information, I was like, wow. Because that guy was just, he's something special. You know, maybe walk us through your journey with that and how, what you did within his program. Well, I did a program called The School of Awakening mm -hmm. with Eckhart, and um, it went over six months. Mm -hmm. We met in person twice in the year, and then we had weekly Zooms. Oh, wow. Um, and it was people <laughs> from all over the world, hundreds of people from all over the world. It was yeah. really fascinating. But I know exactly what you're talking about in terms of reading The Power of Now. And I believe it's that book that Eckhart actually gives instructions on how to read that book. That, you're, yeah. that he wants you to read a paragraph or two or three yeah. and then put it down. Yeah. And then pick it up again. Because that one's pretty intense. That book, if you're, if you're brand new into the spiritual realm or you're just starting your journey, boy, that wouldn't be the first one I would pick up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it was. I think I think I heard Oprah talk about it. I was like, I need this this book. I need something that has substance, some value, and that one was the one. <laughs> that one's hard to hard not to have value, boy. Oh my goodness! Yes, he is. Um, he's a quirky little guy. Yeah. <laughs> he is amazing. He really is. And you just find yourself sitting on the edge of your seat while he's talking, and yeah. the way that he he creates that sacred space for you is amazing. So the space that he creates before he even opens his mouth is something I've never experienced before. Wow. Just, uh, um, just all of a sudden, you know, you're part of something so much bigger than you've ever realized. I just, it fascinates me how they can get to that place how they, and what are they thinking? Like, how do they look at life? You know, like, how does somebody, what, you know, how do you, what are the, what, how does he talk about himself? Like, how does he look at himself? That's, you know, is he still, does he look at it as, <laughs> is he still on a journey? Does he, how does he see himself? You know, I mean, I always you know, wonder. We're always on a journey. Yeah. We're on our journey forever. For sure. Because every single person you meet is a teacher. Yeah, that's so true. Every person you meet is a teacher. I was a little disturbed by one of my girlfriends who told me the other day, you know, I don't get along with so-and-so, so I don't spend any time with them. And I was a little disappointed because I was thinking, wow, that's a powerful teaching moment for you. Mm. It's a powerful person for you to be with and hang out with. And be uncomfortable with and get in the muck with <laughs> to see what it is that has you judging oh, and evaluating and criticizing that person enough to say, nope, don't want to be with you. Very interesting. We all do that. Yeah, we all do that. We all do that. And if we just were able to be with one another without all of that internal dialogue that says, well, you know, he's too short or she's really loud or I don't like her shirt or whatever it is we do to shut people out of our lives. Practicing being present to that internal dialogue is key. That's the key to the universe. It really is. How do you walk us through your, your morning, you know, with your, like, how do you get your day set up? What's your routine like? Cause I'm really interested in that. Well, I'm in my 14th year of meditation. Yeah. I meditate twice a day, every day for 30 minutes each. Okay. I, I, and then I recommend this to my students too, is that do whatever amount of time you have. If you have 10 minutes, do 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. If you have 20 minutes, do 20 minutes. You never want to run into meditation. You never want to run out. So if you need to be somewhere and a 20 minute meditation is going to make you feel like you got to get up and go at the end, don't do that. Make it shorter and stay. Because mm, you want to keep that beautiful stillness that you create in your meditation. So, because 
it doesn't so matter ma doesn't so much matter what's happening on the cushion as what matters out there when you're in the world so i wake up from my sleep state and i rpm rise p meditate so when you're already in this quiet space of having just woken up take care of yourself sit right back down remember earlier we were talking about your physiology settling down so your physiology is already pretty quiet in the morning mm -hmm. so no coffee mm -hmm. no exercise before you meditate you just sit right back down your physiology is already at rest let's keep it there for a little while longer do your meditation 20 minutes whatever it is you have when you come out of meditation then go about your day because you know it, it, it's it's a discipline and it's like the gym for me if i don't go after i meditate i won't go that day so i'm not gonna come back at two in the afternoon and go to the gym if i didn't go in the morning mm. it's just sort of that way so i take the opportunity as part of my daily routine to just put it in there yeah and then you go about your day and then in the evening time the second meditation some of my students like the 5 to 5.30 hour or when they get home from work and before dinner mm -hmm. as their second time. That period of time has never worked for me. I'm, you know, I'm cooking and dishes and dogs and you know, yeah. all of it. So I wait until a few hours after dinner when the dishes are done and everyone's doing their homework and the dogs have settled down. So from 9 to 9.30, I do my second one. And then I get ready for bed between 9.30 and 10, and I go to bed on the dot at 10 p.m. almost religiously. Mm. So it's really important that you start to shift your habits. So if your habit is to crawl into bed and turn on the TV and watch Criminal Minds before you fall asleep, I would not recommend that. Mm. I would not recommend that you have your television in your room. Have your room be that sacred space for you to just settle in and reconnect and then go to sleep. Mm -hmm. You don't want to fall asleep to violence no. or you know any of that kind of stuff. The other thing I highly recommend is that you turn your phone off for a minimum of one hour a day. You turn it off. I don't mean turn the ringer off. I mean shut the whole thing down. Training yourselves not to be tempted to pick it up and check an email or check a Facebook or check an Insta or whatever it is you check. Unraveling that habit. Stopping that habit. Noticing that that's the way you take yourself out. Go into the doctor's office. How many people are you talking to anymore? None. Everyone's on their phone. Even Everyone's in the elevator in my own building, people are on, people don't even talk to each other. It's walking like, through the airport. Madness. Walking across the street without even looking up. This is who we become. Mm -hmm. So if you if you want your life to settle down and you want your monkey mind to calm down and you want to start feeling more peace and joy and you have to take action in your own life to start taking away some of those habits that are not good for you. That's that mindful consumption we were talking about. You're going to hate this. Your audience is going to hate this. But you charge your phone in the kitchen. That phone is no longer your alarm clock. One of the first requirements of my students is that they go down to the pharmacy and they get one of those $12 digital alarm clocks that we used to use. Yeah, it's a great and idea. You, you use that again. And no longer is the first thing you do picking up that phone and scrolling before you're even out of bed. Particularly yeah. if you're in relationship with someone. Mm. Particularly if you're in relationship with somebody. If you want to restore connection and that type of intimacy, you have to be present. You have to be present. And if you'd rather pick up your phone than roll over and say, good morning, honey, 
that might not be the greatest way to start your day. Something's wrong there. Yeah. Yeah. I've, um, I've 99% of the time I turn mine on airplane mode and turn off the Wi-Fi. I still use it as an alarm, but I like that idea. I like that. I had taken it a step further because I still get tempted but you, I just, I do like you do. As first thing I do, um, get up. I'll have a little bit of water, and then I'll go meditate, or I won't have water, and I'll meditate. And I find that to be the best. I can just get in that half an hour zone, and there's something magical about it. Especially in the more, the earlier I get up, too, the better. You know, um, what are your, what time do you get up? Are you a four thirty, five o'clock person, or five, five, five thirty? Depends. There's something magical in the, at that hour. Yeah. Yeah, really, four four twenty is really the magic time. Something happens in the universe at four twenty. Yeah, there's. I've I've tried this, and I'm not just saying this to to anybody to say that you got to get up at that hour. I've tried it. I've tried sleeping in. I've done the night shift stuff. I've done it all, and for some reason, if I go to bed at ten and get up at four thirty, it's like there there's this profound change of energy and motivation in my day. Just everything goes well. Yet, for some reason, I resist the fact that I don't want to get up at that hour, even though I know every single time it's going to make the day so much better. We're talking about habits again, right? Yeah. So if you, want to, if you want to make your life better, if you want <laughs> to have more peace and joy, it's going to take something from yeah. all of us, each of us. It isn't going to just land in your lap. You can't just meditate once and presto, you're awakened. And you've got nirvana. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. But we look, we're the we're the Google generation, right? Yeah. If I need something, Google it. Crazy. If I want to know something, Google it. God forbid I ask you. <laughs> <laughs> what about the teachers nowadays? It must drive them nuts. It's crazy. Well, and the fact that we don't have conversations like the one you and I are having yeah. very often ever with our, the people we love the most, yeah, that's what's missing is community. And I think personally, I think that there's an epidemic of loneliness. You yeah. think we think we're connected because of all this stuff on our phones and all this social media and everything, but we're more disconnected from each other than ever. Yeah. Big time. Big time. Everyone's like, who cares what everybody else is doing? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it, it's like even if you're sitting down at dinner with friends, you're like, everybody here is here and we're all in the present and we're all the human bodies or in the meat suits or whatever you want to call them. And they're here, but yet we're on the phone looking for something else. It's so bizarre and we all do it. So like you bring so up another great little trick. Yeah. You are going out to dinner with somebody or you've got a group of friends coming over for dinner. Make an agreement together that all phones are off and in the middle of the table and no one touches them till they leave. That's a great idea. That's one of my house rules at Satsang House, my meditation mm. center here, is no phones are allowed on the premises. Yeah. You cannot bring your cell phone into my house. That's awesome. Yeah, because, and do you know how squirrely people get? It's nuts. Just about that one little rule. Oh, for some of them, you'd think I took their arm off. I know. It's crazy. But that's, but that's how we train ourselves to become, come back to the present moment. The first night that you don't have your phone by your bedside, you're not going to feel comfortable. Yeah. The first morning, it, doesn't, it isn't waking you up, and you're having to rely on a, on a Rite Aid you know, yeah. digital alarm clock, you might not sleep so well because you don't trust it. Yeah. But that's the point. That's the point. You got to get discomfort. You got to get uncomfortable. For sure. Nothing right? feels better than when you're in control and you're in the driver's seat. Like for me, if I get all the routine done and I go, all right, now I could turn this on and I'm in control. I'm not in reactive mode. I am choosing to turn my phone on and this is the choice. And now, right, instead of, well, I'll just, I'll just do a little sneaky check on Instagram. And then you get caught in the loophole. And then it's like you're constantly reacting, reacting, reacting. And, you know, you're like, oh, I did it again. And that's it. What yeah. you just said is the key. Yeah. That you're training yourself and your brain to be in a chronic reactive state. 
Yeah. So just what you said was so perfect. It's like I'm reacting and reacting and reacting. So your entire day is about reacting. Yeah. So this is the other thing you asked me earlier in the conversation. What was some of the things that I noticed about myself that changed in after meditation? And what I really noticed that instead of being so reactionary, I became responsive. So instead of reacting, I became much more responsive. There's a huge distinction there. And I tell people too, that it takes about two weeks of a solid twice a day, every day meditation practice for you to kind of get hooked into the groove of it, but also to start to notice that subtle but very profound shift that starts to take place in who you are. Your listening may become better. You might be sleeping better. How has that affected your family around you? How is that? Because a lot of people don't realize that either, that your energy affects your environment as well that you're around. How has that helped everything? Well, we cannot separate ourselves from our environment. No matter how mm. much we want to, we can't. As long mm. as you're breathing, you're part of the environment. Yeah. Each breath I take is coming from the environment, right? Mm. Um, our energy goes out as far as two miles. So you ever notice when somebody comes through the door, you can almost instantly see, oh my God, they're in a bad mood. Yes. I've always been able to do that. Yes. Some people can't though. Some people aren't intuitive like that. Or, or is everybody like that? I don't know. Everyone can feel it if they're paying attention. Literally, it's all about being present, right? Yeah. Now, in this moment, mm. and this moment, and this moment, and this moment, and this moment in each moment because if you're not present then it's almost as if the moment never happened right <laughs> that's so true <laughs> it's crazy well think about it if yeah. i went to the beach and i watched the sunset and this beautiful waves were crashing and then the seagull came and it landed and another seagull came by and they sat together then they flew off and i took a picture as it was happening then I came to you and I said, come with me. Come and see what I see at the ocean. Come on. Yeah. Look, at, look at what we can see. We get down there. There's no seagulls. The sun is down. The ocean has calmed down. You're like, why'd you bring me here? I'm not seeing what you saw. Because what I saw was in that moment. Mm. And that moment is gone. And we take for granted those moments. Very precious moments. And it is truly like it didn't even happen if you're not present for it. Even if you have a nice meal and you're distracted by TV, or there's times where I'll have a nice meal in front of me and I won't even notice that I ate it. Like, it's crazy. I'm like, oh, that was, that's weird. I didn't even... And, and I mean, how many people do that with every single activity? You get up, you have a nice, beautiful cup of tea or coffee. They're, you're not paying attention. You know, you have something to eat, you're not paying attention. You're, you're doing something and thinking about something else all day, all the time. So this is where we go back to that idea of mindful consumption. Mm -hmm. So those people that don't even sit to eat or don't even chew their food, mm. I would put my dog in that category. She just inhales. I don't even see her chew. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But how many of us just walk by the counter, grab an apple and keep going? Or we go to Starbucks and we drink coffee for lunch. We forget that our physical body is just as important as our spiritual body. Mindful consumption is all of it. It's what I'm watching on TV. It's the people I'm allowing into my life. Are they toxic for me or are they nurturing for me? Am I eating something that's healthy for me or it's going to make my insulin go nuts or my you know, digestion hurt? Am I even paying attention to what I'm doing? And one really great exercise too is if you get in that sense that you just described where you kind of just didn't even realize you were eating, try to train yourself to stop and say, what am I doing? Yeah. What am I doing? Like, what am I doing right th Yeah. It's, what am I doing? Yeah. And the other thing I recommend is that you start training yourself to ask when that mind goes nuts, is it true? 
this criticism I have of so and so is that even true or did I just make that up super important to put little habits into your day that remind you to be aware and awake and present one of my favorites is I tell my students you pick one of your five senses each day so let's say today is the sense of smell so throughout the day I'm gonna tune in to what I smell Ooh, I smell a freshly mowed lawn ah smell mm. that newly cooking waffle cone oh mm. Ooh, there's dog dew. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's roasted chicken. So just tuning in to what that sense is picking up. And then tomorrow, have it be sight, maybe. Look at those two 80-year-olds holding hands. Isn't that sweet? Look at the ocean. Yeah. Look at the bird. Look at the kids playing in the playground. So you're starting to train yourself to be present in each moment. And that one I love because that one really does cause you to put presence into your day. This is, this is just, there's been so much here. It's, I love these conversations. One thing I want to ask you about, and I've talked about it with a few guests, and I've been toying with this idea, is the Vipassana. That's how you say it, right? Vipassana? Vipassana. The, the, but, yeah, okay, because I've heard Vipassana, Vipassana, I don't know. But you did one in India, correct? No. I did the Vipassana here in the United States. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. Can you walk us through this, please? Because this uh -huh. is like so powerful. And I feel like the universe has been testing me to do this. And I don't know if I'm ready. And I, maybe there's people that are, I've heard this, this before. Walk us through this. Oh, you're perfect. <laughs> I, I recommend Vipassana meditation to everyone. Okay. Everyone, whether you've meditated before or not. Okay. It, and understanding it will be the most challenging thing you've ever done in your life. So essentially, Vipassana meditation is a silent meditation. It's called insight meditation. And the idea is it's 10 days. That's the first level. It's 10 days of complete silence. No reading, no writing, no music. No eye-to-eye -eye contact with your neighbor. Not even a, hey, how's it going? None of that. <laughs> yeah. The men are separated from the women. You are in silence every single day for 10 days. So the first day they call day zero, you actually meet some people before you go into the silence. Day one through day 10, not one word is uttered. So, and you are meditating 10, day, 10 hours a day for 10 days. But it's not 10 hours a day all at once. It's 10 hours broken up all day long. So you have a little bit of teaching. You have an hour of meditation. You have a little bit of teaching. You have two hours of meditation. You have a little lunch. You have two hours of meditation. It's like that. Okay. So for the 10 days, it's like that. And it is the meditation that Buddha was doing at the moment of his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree in Sarnath. It's a different kind of meditation. So I mentioned that I teach mantra meditation. So there's all kinds of meditations. There's visualizations, there's tantric, there's um, breath work, there's uh, all kinds of things that you could do. Vipassana meditation is all about keying into sensation. So you literally start by tuning into the little triangular space in between your nose and mouth mm -hmm. and you allow yourself to feel that air coming out of your nostril hitting the little hairs above your lip and you just notice and you spend an hour noticing that oh, wow. <laughs> and each day as the day wears on you start taking on a different part of your body and ultimately, by day four, after the training is complete, you are going from doing basically a, a sensation body scan, is what I'll call it, from the crown of your head to the bottom of your feet, up the back of your back, and back up again, over and over again. And you pause on any of those areas of the body where you may be feeling discomfort, pain or anything like that 
and you don't go anywhere until that pain or discomfort dissipates. And in this process, you don't move. You don't scratch. You don't cough. You don't sneeze. You don't re resettle your body if you're uncomfortable. So I have a hip thing, right? So every now and then in meditation, the hip is going to start screaming. Mm -hmm. Can't move. Can't change it. Have to sit with the pain and the sensation of that pain until it dissipates, just to be with it. So if you're bored, you sit with that. If you're hungry, you sit with that. If you want to cry, you sit with that. The idea is, as in all Buddhist practice, is that you sit and be with the suffering. You confront your own suffering and discomfort because therein lies the lesson. Therein lies the gold. So it's training in being present with yourself. Discomfort, ache, pain, itch, tickle, whatever it is, for hours and hours. So literally, a vipassana is kind of like a training to be a monk or a nun, a Buddhist nun. So you really are living just like they would in a monastery. But you don't need to be a monastic to practice this way. Right? You don't have to go live in a monastery. You can be what they call a householder, which is me and you. We still work and do our thing, but we practice spirituality mm. to keep our practice going. It's intense. I've heard. I've because heard. you are you're you're there with you. You're stuck with you. So you, you take a commitment that you are not going to kill anything that week. So that means you're not going to step on a bug just for the sake of stepping on a bug. You're not going to have sex. You're not going to uh, lie. You're not going to steal. And you're not going to do drugs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that may seem really easy. Oh, I can do that for 10 days. But you would be astounded at how much of your stuff gets glued to your face in this 10 days. All of the things that we want to do to take us out of the present moment come flooding up to the surface. Oh my God, I got to read. Oh, I got to turn the music on. Oh, I need to check my Instagram. Ooh, I need to go eat. All of those things that we do that are not mindful consumption come up like rear their head because you can't do them. You've mm -hmm. made a commitment and a vow for 10 days. You're not going to. So this is part of why they separate the men from the women. So if you're someone who uses sex as one of the ways you check out or porn or whatever, you not even have the opposite sex around you during that 10 days. If you're someone that eats when they get bored, which would be me, mm, me too. You, you can't go snacking. Your meal times are set. You eat your biggest meal in the middle of the day and you have soup and fruit at dinner. That's it. So all of the things that we use as our crutch to avoid one another or ourselves will come up to confront you. So do, do they use this process for people who are addicted to different things? on a certain level like i mean maybe not right out of but i'm just wondering i think it would be essential on at least one part of the the process for somebody that is addicted to something to sit through that for 10 days but whether that's the first step probably not but it may be a good way to like kind of really solidify the change well i mean i i agree with you completely and Here's the thing, though. Most people don't even realize that they're addicted. They think addiction oh, means drinks or alcohol or drugs or, you know, oxycodone. Addiction can come in a million different forms. Yeah. I, I got a Netflix binge watch for 10 hours. You know, yeah. I got to eat that pint of ice cream all by myself every single day. I've got mm -hmm. to check my email or my Instagram all day long. Or I got to play video games. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that those are addictive behaviors. And until you take them away, you're not even asking yourself about those behaviors because they're kind of on automatic. You've allowed yourself to become habituated to the behavior. 
And you can't even get to the root of what is causing it because you're not even allowed that thing to be taken out. Or so. you are so stressed in your daily life, like we all are. You're going from one thing to another thing to another thing. You're like a hamster on a wheel 24 hours a day that you don't have time or you don't think you have time to just take time out for you. So mm -hmm. the first place to find compassion is self-compassion. That's the first place to look mm -hmm. because I can't be compassionate to you or anyone else if I'm not compassionate on myself. So if I'm not treating myself well, how in the world will I treat you? I can't even tell you. I grew up in uh, Spain, in Europe, for a significant portion of my young, young life. Oh, wow. And my dad was in the United States. My mom and I were in Spain. And I remember writing my dad a letter when I was about 12. And I said, I really would like to move home and go to high school and live with you. I never got a response. This was me at 12. So from that experience, I believe for 40 years that my dad didn't want me, that he didn't care, that he just didn't want me to live with him. He didn't, he didn't respond. So all of my adult life, my teenage life, young woman, when I was married, all of that, all of my relationships were with men were somehow tainted by that experience. That he doesn't love me, he doesn't want me. Hmm. When I was doing the Vipassana, we have a little time to take some walks, and I would walk up to the very top of this hill and, that overlooked the town, and I would just sit there. And I remember all I could thinking of was this, this letter and dad, this letter and dad and we're talking 40 years later mm. i've never thought about it before really no. i mean consciously so i get home from the vipassana and all i can think about is i gotta meet with dad now i don't have much of a relationship with my father it's just not like that so i picked up the phone i said can i take you to lunch sure is everything okay he's really worried something happened because he we don't really yeah. talk yeah. So I take him to lunch and he's still worried. Is everything okay? Thinking something's wrong with my son or something's wrong with somebody. Mm. And I asked him, I said, hey, do you remember that letter I sent to you when I was about 12 from Spain? And he looks up from his salad and he said, what letter? I never got a letter from you. Oh, wow. <laughs> when did you send that? So wow. all this time... Wow. Well, all I got this, goosebumps from that. Yeah. So all this time I had ordered my life around. My father doesn't love me or want me. <sighs> and that's how I had lived my life. And had I not had a conversation, that's that part about asking yourself, is it true? Oh, yeah. We believe the stuff that we create in our brains. And if we don't ever check it out, look what it, the consequence. Think of all that that you created in your mind over the years, and it didn't even happen. That's it right. It wasn't even true. <laughs> he had no awareness of it either. And here you might have, you probably thought he was a certain way because of it too. All the judgment. And that's why we didn't have a relationship because I stayed away because he doesn't oh. want me. He doesn't love me. Wow. It's pretty intense and that's the kind of thing that happens when you're by yourself and you're confronted with yourself with no distraction and no regular go-to of your phone or your TV or whatever you do to take yourself out of being with yourself what are we so afraid of yeah it's oh yeah it's it's I think we're afraid to see what we're going to see what's there i don't know it's i think a lot of us don't even really think about it like that you know what this is a kind of off topic but kind of on topic what are your thoughts on plant medicine and discovering it that way because are you talking about ayahuasca well that or psilocybin or anything that allows you to kind of go there without because I know you can get there through breath work, you can do a lot of things, you can explore. There's also some things that that you can 
you know, I mean, people have their mixed opinions on it. I find it fascinating just, just hearing the, you know, where people are at with it because our world is changing and a lot of people are having profound effects from it. You know, what are your thoughts on it? I don't see the need to do an ayahuasca trip. Completely find whatever mm. it is you're looking for all by yourself, by just reconnecting to you. Mm. We don't need to grasp and cling at a drug mm -hmm. or something ex ex external mm -hmm. to, quote, find whatever that is. Because it's already there. Yeah, you're right. It's already there. We're the ones who keep filling it up with mm. stuff and thinking that it's not. Mm. So I personally don't subscribe to the ayahuasca mm. thing because I think that you can... Interesting. Reconnect to yourself without it. I also, um, I totally understand the psilocybin uh, research that's going on. In fact, I have a gentleman who's a researcher from Yale coming here this week because I offer light therapy. Mm -hmm. I have a, a, a light that stimulates and opens the third eye mm. and causes a psychedelic experience. DMT to be released? It's you're going into an alpha state. And when you go into that alpha state, then you see all kinds of sacred geometry and colors you've never seen before. It's like a kaleidoscope. Wow, from the light. From a light Whoa. that opens your third eye. Amazing. And then the movie that gets created is your brain creating it. No drugs, hmm. no mushrooms, no LSD just a light. So, I mean, I don't, I, I don't judge anybody who does do ayahuasca or anything like that. Yeah, no, for sure. But, um, why? See, this is yeah. that going back to that looking for happiness out there, mm -hmm. grasping and clinging and striving and searching for the answer out there. The answer is not out there. You have everything you need right here. Everything. There's no reason to look outside. Love it. Oh, I, I love the perspective. It's great. I love. I love to hear that. You know, because that's yeah. I mean, it's it's true. It's it's definitely not for everybody either. You know, I think it's one of those things that if you feel called to it, then maybe you should get curious about exploring it. But I don't think you need to really do it. You know, if you if you're not if it's not calling you, don't don't go looking for it. Kind of thing, right? I mean, no. these kind of these kind of things sort of show up in ways, you know, where they, you know, once you get curious, maybe doors start to open and they get presented to you. But yeah, and you really need to be very careful yeah. if you ha suffer from anxiety or other mm. things like that, or you might be mentally ill in some form. Right. You need to be very, very careful with the kinds of things that you experiment with because there are points of no return. That's a great point. I'm really glad we talked about that because that's, you know, this is the conversation going around, right? There's a lot of stuff, you know, talking about it. And I think it's really important. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was watching a documentary about that as well, is that you really got to be careful with, well, even smoking marijuana or anything like that. It can trigger a lot of things with people that have, you know, if you have schizophrenia or you're, mm -hmm. you're destined to have it or you have bad anxiety, it can kind of, that, uh, Michael Pollan talked about this talked about it can speed it up right and you got to be mindful of that right very yeah very mm. yeah doesn't it make more sense to just shut your eyes for 20 totally it, but people mantra? want the easy way out right <laughs> here's what i say to that yeah. you can't google peace you can't you can't find it in a special package you can't go get it at the store you can't find it at Amazon. You can't Google peace. It has to come from here. I love it. I love it. And we'll end it there. I, uh, I could talk to you all day. You're very knowledgeable. Time flies when you're having great conversations, as you know. I want to just kind of ending this. I want to kind of touch on your podcast because I want people to check it out. Life Illuminated and, and wherever where else we can find you as well. Great. Yes. Life Illuminated podcast is on all the podcast platforms, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Blueberry, all of them, Google Play. Okay. Um, and uh, if you're looking for me, you can look at, you can go to uh, maggiekelly.com 
or you can look at my website at satsanghouse.net and that s-a-t-s-a-n-g house.net and the word satsang actually means a community of like-minded people joined together mm. so that's what we're creating over here awesome oh i love it i really truly appreciate you coming in and you know giving so much value to our listeners because um these conversations are are so powerful and just to give like, you know, I've had a few different conversations like this, but, you know, maybe somebody can hear this and it'll be that one that really just kind of goes, Ping, okay, this is the thing. I'm going to try this now. And that is the gold, you know? <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. And you can go online to dhamma.org to look for a Vipassana meditation anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. they're, they're offered all over the world in all different kinds of languages. And they are free of charge, donation-based like mm. most Buddhist practice, practice the practice of uh, dana paramita, which is the practice of generosity. So you give whatever you feel at the end of your 10 days. I went to one facility outside of Salt Lake City and was just absolutely stunning. Beautiful. Great food, all of it. You definitely need to be right at the computer the minute it opens for registration because yeah. they do fill up. Yeah. Well, with one last question that I ask everybody, um, out of all the adversity and challenges that you've gone through in your life, what is one lesson that you've been, that adversity has taught? No mud, no lotus. And the reason why the lotus is the Buddhist flower is because it grows out of a mucky, muddy pond. And that beautiful flower comes out and sprouts. So if we don't have adversity, how will we ever know what it looks like to not have adversity, right? You've got to have yeah. the toothache in order to know what it's like not to have a toothache. And it's in that suffering and it's in that muck where we find the gold. So don't run from it. Turn around and face it. That's where the lesson is. <laughs> That's so great. Uh, again, thank you so much. And You're we'll welcome. make sure everybody can find you in the show notes and everything that we need is going to be in there. Terrific. Thanks awesome. so much for having me, Lance. Thank you. Maggie Kelly, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Make sure to share this if you can with a friend. Anybody that needs this, share it. We want to grow this thing. We want to add as much value into people's lives as possible. So I really appreciate your help on this mission. Check out Maggie's work. It's all in the show notes. She is an amazing, amazing human being. And I feel privileged and honored to have spoke with her. So have an amazing day, everybody. We will catch you next time. And there you go was a super nice time and a great chat with Lance SEOs. And again, he is uh, a podcaster himself. And the name of his podcast is the University of Adversity. And he continues to speak to people about the challenges and way to over ways to overcome them. And um, if you like the podcast, I really encourage you just like he said to rate, review, share, comment, and stay tuned. There's always another episode around the corner, and we'd love to have you join us. Have a beautiful day. Mm -hmm.